I'm Jeff Goldberg. Uh, I work for David Bradley. Um, thank, thank you. That's for David Bradley. Um, I, uh, we decided, uh, because it's been a, a long afternoon of conversation, that um, the best thing to do would be to end this uh, session on a light and entertaining and, and humorous program. So we just want to talk about the future of the Middle East. Um, and we have here to do that uh, one of the world's reigning experts, certainly the, uh, one of the leading American experts on the complexity uh, of the Middle East, the challenges that, uh, that the wor world's instability uh, poses to U.S. national security. Of course, is David Petraeus. You have, thank you. Institute, uh, but he is, I think it's fair to say, widely considered to be one of the most effective American generals, uh, army leaders uh, of uh, the post-war era, and I don't, I mean World War II. I mean, if you look back and think about generals who've, who've changed the course of American history and the American military, you have to put David Petraeus in the top category. So I want to jump right in with you. David, if we, if we may. Um, and uh, I was listening to the, uh, this conversation about mild optimism and mild pessimism. Uh, we're about to approach what might be the most important moment in Obama administration foreign policy, the, the, the culmination of a long, hard slog toward an Iranian nuclear agreement. Um, you have studied this for a long time, and you have just recently become very, very public in raising doubts about the particulars of the deal that seems to be uh, taking shape uh, at the moment. So I wanted you to talk about uh, your criticism or your worries about where we might be headed to next week, and then we could jump from there. Sure. Well, first of all, look, it's great to be back here, and it's wonderful to be with all of you. They're hanging in there in a warm afternoon uh, in the tent. Uh, it's wonderful to be interviewed by one of David Bradley's all-stars. Uh, you all know how he is recruited uh, by David. If not, it makes a great story for later on. Uh, and then as to whether I'm an optimist or a pessimist, uh, I'll give the same answer that I used to give during the surge in Iraq, and that is that I'm neither. I'm a realist. And the reality is uh, that we are on the threshold of what could be uh, potentially an agreement of far-reaching significance. And there's a group that I've worked with for some two, over two years, includes a number of former Obama administration officials, appoint, political appointees, uh, I guess I would count among them, uh, and then others from other administrations. We do believe that we are nonpartisan or bipartisan, uh, and we've been studying the Iran nuclear agreement uh, as it's made its way along. And we recently published a letter, and it's signed only by those that are part of this group. Again, we weren't out looking for people to add, you know, for, for tree trimmings or something like that. And it basically said that we're concerned about five aspects of the agreement, uh, that to be a good agreement, which everyone has said, you know, if it's not good, uh, a bad agreement, uh, no agreement is better than a bad agreement. Well, a bad agreement would be one that did not have sufficiently intrusive verification uh, that didn't uh, provide an ability to determine the possible military dimensions of past Iranian activity, uh, that did not have limits on advanced centrifuge research and development, uh, that didn't have the proper timing of sanctions relief. As you know, the Iranians want the sanctions lifted immediately when they sign on the dotted line. Uh, there should at the very least be a phase sanctions relief where the really good uh, stuff that they want is not actually, uh, re re they're not released from that until you actually have met all of the uh, major criteria that are in the agreement. Uh, and then provisions to resume sanctions. It's very important that if Iran is shown to have cheated, that there be an actual process that cannot be ended by the Chinese or the Russians casting a veto uh, as a member of the Permanent Five of the UN Security Council. What, we, are, the, what are the consequences of a bad deal? Can't well, to, can't, let's assume that the thing that you don't want to have happen happens. Well, again, if you, if you don't have sufficient verification, something untoward could go on. If you can't figure out what they did in the past in the military dimensions, again, you don't know, uh, you don't have the knowledge that you really need to, be, to assure yourself that you can have this one-year standard met, because the policy is to achieve a one-year 
uh, from the time that they decide until you could actually have a weapon. By the way, let me point out, there are many desirable features in this agreement. Uh, it takes all the 20 percent, gets rid of it, the 20 percent enriched uranium. It reduces the uh, low enriched to a very uh, small amount that can't be used for a single bomb. Uh, it retools the heavy water reactor that could have provided a plutonium path to a bomb. Uh, it rules out enrichment in the deeply buried site inside the mountain in Fordo. So uh, again, there's a lot of goodness here. We should just recognize, again, be realistic, uh, that, that if you don't get some of these other features, uh, that you could have some surprises. And then the second is, remember, it ends in 10 years, uh, some of it, and then some ends in 15. So uh, we have to be careful not to assume, uh, we have to think beyond that 10 years. I think to assume that Iran is going to change from its current powers, it's a revolutionary power. It's not status, satisfied with the status quo. It wants to be the regional hegemon. And to go from that and support for various uh, Shia militia proxy elements, terrorist designated terrorist groups like Lebanese Hezbollah, uh, Shia militias in Iraq, uh, Houthis in Yemen, and others in a variety of other places, all using their own terrorist designated organization, the uh, Quds Force. I want to come back to the deal in, in a second, but let me ask you this because uh, it's very clear on the part of the Obama administration. They believe that the money that the Iranians will get as part of this windfall, 100 billion, 150 billion maybe in the first year after the relief, after sanctions leak kicks in, they're gonna use that, the Obama administration argues, for roads and infrastructure, hospitals, schools, uh, that they're not going to spend a lot of money on Hezbollah, on the Assad regime, on, uh, on the Houthis in Yemen. Do you buy that? Um, look, I'm sure that a great deal will be spent on those types of uh, infrastructure projects. Uh, President Rouhani was elected to improve the lot and life of the people and, and to improve the economy. But when the times have been but really... But is he really when, in charge? When the, when the times have really been tight, they've still managed to find the odd billions of dollars to fund Hamas, Lebanese Hezbollah, Shiite militias here and there and, and other nefarious activities of the Quds Force and Hezbollah, not to mention just underwriting Bashar al-Assad's regime in Syria uh, on top of everything else. So the idea that this would not mean that more would actually go into that, I think, would be probably uh, questionable. On, on, the, on the deal itself, we talked about the consequences of a bad deal. What are the consequences of no deal? Put aside the idea that, that the supreme leader of Iran might just say sure. no. Then it becomes fairly clear that we're moving toward confrontation. But what if, let's say, Congress steps in and uh, does something, feels that the deal isn't good, undermines it in some way. Where are we, where are we then with a, with a, with a, with a no-deal situation? Well, to, to some degree, it depends on how we get to a no-deal. Um, if it's a no-deal because the countries involved all say this is just not a good deal and we shouldn't therefore go, go forward, that's very different. Uh, if it is Congress that says it, we could be in a difficult position with the permanent five members plus Germany who have negotiated this deal in good faith with, with us. So that, Congress is, is in a difficult position in that case, uh, and it'll be very interesting to see those dynamics. But if you really don't get a deal, then Iran presumably goes back to enriching more uh, uranium. It replaces the 20 percent enriched uranium that it's already destroyed as part of the, the uh, interim agreement, and it reverses those other steps that, where they walk back elements in part of the interim agreement, and it continues on the path, presumably, uh, to more and more on the threshold of a nuclear weapon. Would, would military confrontation be inevitable at that point? I think it's inevitable if, if, they, if there is incontrovertible evidence that they are moving to make a bomb. And is that military That's our president's policy. And he's, this isn't, that was not, that was very deliberately thought through, uh, announced a number of different occasions, and I think it would be a mistake for Iran to, to think that, that that's not So reality. you believe that President Obama would still, under certain circumstances, use military force against Iran? I think he would, actually. And I know, obviously, we've had red lines that turned out not to be red lines. There have been some other issues where decisions weren't made uh, at key times. I think this is a different issue, and I, and I clearly recognize how the administration has sought to show that this is very, very different from other sort of off-the-cuff remarks. How did the administration keep Israel from attacking 
Iran? And do you think that if this deal does go south, that Iran, that Israel would be back in the picture? Um, I don't, actually. Uh, I think Israel is very cognizant of its limitations. Uh, it knows that it cannot crack. This is publicly known. There's nothing I'm sharing. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs actually If you want to share disclosed. private information, please feel sure, free. Sure, I know. Uh, but um, chairman of the Joint Chiefs in an open hearing did note that the Israelis do, do not have anything that can crack this deeply buried, hardened enrichment site inside the mountain at Fordo. Um, and if you can't do that, uh, there, you're, gonna, you're not going to set the program back all that much. So is it, is it truly worth it then? Um, so that's a huge limitation. It's also publicly known that we have a 30,000 pound projectile uh, that no one else has, no one else can even carry. Explain uh, that a little bit more. Well, the massive ordnance penetrator was actually under design for probably, I guess now about six years. I think it was probably started when I was the commander of Central Command, when in fact it's publicly known that we developed the plan uh, that if necessary, uh, we can take out that, all these facilities right. uh, and set them back for, you know, roughly a few years based on your assumptions. But, you know, that's another roll of the iron dice, as Bismarck used to say, and you never know when those dice are rolled what the outcome is going to be. Uh, you don't know what risks could materialize uh, for those who are in harm's way, you don't know what the response could be by Iran. I mean, there's always an assumption there'll be salvos at, at Israel, but what if they decide to, to, to go at the Gulf states where we have facilities in every single one? This me, is, a, so, and this, so the, again, this is not something to be undertaken lightly, clearly. Let me broaden this out a, a little bit by, by mentioning uh, two statements that were made the last couple of days here. I, I interviewed Ben Rhodes, who is the Deputy National Security Advisor. No, I'm well. Uh, uh, as you do. Um, and later that same day, interviewed Lindsey Graham, asked them both the same question, which was, who is more dangerous to American national security, uh, the Iranians, the Revolutionary Guard Corps of Iran, or ISIS, the, the Shia extreme or the Sunni extreme? Ben Rhodes said, without hesitation, ISIS. Lindsey Graham said, without hesitation, the Iranians. Where do you fall on that? Well, I used to do this for a living, and so mine is a little bit more nuanced. Uh, interestingly, I think Ben is right on the threat to the United States. Uh, the ISIS threat really in the region, uh, the Sunni extremist threat to our allies and partners in Europe and elsewhere in the world, and indeed to our own homeland. I mean, we've seen recent examples of what appear to be orchestrated attacks, and there certainly is a trepidation about this upcoming holiday uh, that is a bit heightened uh, over previous years. Be however, uh, Senator Graham's right, one of the great members of the Three Amigos, as you remember, McCain, Graham, and Lieberman, about the only guys in all of Washington who had my back during certain times. But, you know, Lindsey Graham's right that in the region, the Shia militia supported by the proxies, really, for Iran are very, very dangerous. And they really would, it, it, you sense, in fact, uh, this possibility of an all-out Sunni-Shia civil war, because you have the Sunni extremists that would love to see that happen, and then you see the, the Shia uh, militia, in some cases extremists, who are active in Sunni areas, for example, in, in Iraq, and that just doesn't work. Uh, it's one reason ISIS was able to get back into Iraq, is because, of course, the government of Iraq alienated that Sunni Arab population that would work so hard to bring back into the fold of, back into the fabric of society uh, during the surge and indeed for the years beyond that. How, how dangerous is ISIS to the United States right now? I think the danger to the United States right now is that it, they are seen as a successful organization and nothing succeeds in the online recruiting business like success. Uh, nothing succeeds in attracting would-be jihadists uh, to a location. And just the sheer proselytizing that they can do on the internet, we've seen how they can get people who are tr almost trying to self-recruit. And it doesn't take many people with what you can buy at a gun show in America to cause enormous havoc if you open up in a mall or some public place that's full of people. So I think that's a significant danger. I don't think it's yet anywhere near the kind of 9-11 attack sophistication danger, um, but it is, it, it poses, a, and, and then to our allies, and we've seen very vividly uh, what has been done in Europe as a result of ISIS's 
recruiting. If you were still advising the president, what would you advise him to do right now in Syria and Iraq, which is more or less the same battlefield? Yeah. We, we hear reports, we've been hearing reports for years, of course, that Assad is on his last legs. It seems as if he's losing territory by the day that it seems plausible, although it's almost impossible to imagine this, it seems plausible that some constellation of jihadist forces, including ISIS, could march on Damascus mm -hmm. at some point. W what, does that, what does that mean for America, and what should the president be doing now, apart from what he is doing? Well, in Syria, you've just flat got to accelerate the effort to get moderate Sunni opposition forces out is, there. Is that possible or is that just it something is, that we say no, because there's it, no other I answer? I think it's possible. Uh, there are, certainly were moments when it was much more possible than it is now. Was it a mistake not to do it in 2011? Uh, you know, if I had advised something at that time, it would have been covert action given where I was. And so not something that I can talk about now. New York Times certainly has some of the memoirs of the other participants. So have. theoretically, if you had been running the CIA in 2011, you would theoretically have advocated for that? Theoretically. Theoretically. Okay. Just want to check. Aggressively. Aggressively and theoretically. <laughs> Actually, it was a little bit later, but... <laughs> okay. Right. All right. But, go, but go I can on, neither but... confirm or deny. Okay. Uh, he's not actually here at all, by the no, way. You're not no, even seeing that. It's a hologram. Uh, but so you, you have to do that. I mean, again, we have to... Have, look, I don't care what your goal is in Syria at this point in time. You want to say, let them break up. You want to say, try to keep it together. You want to partition, whatever it is you want to do to, to defeat ISIL, which we have to do, and even the Al-Qaeda affiliate, very likely Jabhat al-Nusra, we've got to have a force that we can support to do that. We can use the Syrian Kurds for those areas in which they feel comfortable, but they don't want to push, nor should they push, into areas that are not traditionally Kurdish. Are, are we in a position right now where it might become in the American national security interest to prop up the Assad regime? No. No, no, I don't, I don't think an individual who's responsible for the deaths of approaching 250,000 Syrians, the displacement outside the country of millions, over a million each in uh, Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey, and men, many millions more inside the country, who really started this by violently putting down peaceful Sunni demonstrations, uh, and who is supported by Hezbollah, the Quds Force, and Iran, so no, no, I don't think so. Um, you know, there's some attraction. I actually, you know, I was invited to go see him several times, in fact, when I was a commander in Iraq. Um, and, you know, I know he wanted a photo op with a general, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and we're, we're up for that on occasion. But I really wanted to go to him and say, you know, Mr. President, you're allowing poisonous snakes, Al-Qaeda facilitators, to have a nest in your backyard with the understanding that they only bite the neighbor's kids, Iraq. Sooner or later, these are gonna, they're gonna turn around and bite you, and that's exactly what happened, because of course, Al-Qaeda in Iraq really regained its strength uh, as the pressure came off them in Iraq, and then went over into Syria and really got themselves armed, equipped, funded, and everything else. Here's, a, here's an enormous question, which you can answer in 140 characters, would be wonderful. Uh, if you can ask it in 140 I'll try characters. I can't, I, can't, I can't clear my throat in 140 characters. The, He's a journalist, David. One, print, one, print journalist. Print journalist. It's a terrible affliction. Uh, why is the Middle East disintegrating? Uh, and the subsidiary question to that is, well, there's two, two subsidiary questions. One, what role did the Iraq invasion in 2003, if any, play in accelerating this disintegration that we see, and what role now can America play? One of, the, one of the observations that I've made and others have made of President Obama over the past several years is that uh, he has a tragic understanding of American limitations. Obviously, his critics believe that he has an over-understanding of America's limitations, but how did we get here? How, how, did, how did this disintegration come about, and are we really capable of turning this around yeah. as the United States? Well, first of all, the entire region is not disintegrating. What you have are, are former uh, countries that were ruled by autocrats, and they, almost all of them had 10 decent years, 10 middling years, and then 10 bad years. You look at Mubarak, for example. You look at the dictator in, in, in Tunisia, in Libya, uh, in Syria. These were not uh, the Gulf state monarchies, which, by the way, are doing quite well. 
uh, even the one that has, even two that have no real great oil wealth, Jordan and Bahrain are hanging in there. And the others are, are, are bastions of stability. Uh, we may not like all of the political processes, human rights records, whatever. But, uh, you know, stability does have a bit to commend it when you look at the results of the Arab Spring in all countries with the exception of Tunisia and how tragic the event there. Uh, again, ISIL affiliated, it appears, that shoots up a bunch of uh, dozens of tourists on a beach. What happened is, of, of course, you had situations that were actually, they seemed to be solid on the surface, but it was very fragile. And all it took was a spark and all of a sudden you see a conflagration. And of course it started in Tunisia, it spreads to Egypt, ultimately uh, into uh, Libya, Syria, uh, and even Yemen. Uh, we retrieved Yemen for a while, but then it came unhinged uh, again. Uh, the fact is that it's not clear that in all cases are all these countries going to be put back together again. There are various scenarios where the lines drawn, you know, in the World War I period by the French and British diplomats uh, they, they may not endure. I think that's without question the case in some. In others, I do think they can endure. Interestingly, I actually think Iraq can stay together. Uh, it's going to take, the center of gravity, by the way, is in Baghdad, not on the front lines. We have, obviously, we've got to push those front lines back, kill, capture, displace the ISIS forces that are out there, and you can't allow these reversals, you know, because they are both, they're strategically uh, significant. They're setbacks. They're not just operational setbacks. But we've got to do all that we can uh, to help the Prime Minister, who has espoused the right ideas. He wants again to get the Sunni Arabs back into the fold. He knows he needs to put limits on where the Shia militia can go over time. He's got to get them under national control. Um, he's got to get a new deal with the Kurds, which is generally moving along reasonably well. But, you know, one of the things that I hope we'll see in the weeks ahead or months ahead will be the establishment of a robust military headquarters actually in Baghdad at the three-star level with someone in charge of it who knew what we did back in the surge and the reconciliation component in particular and can help the ambassador the way I tried to help Ambassador Crocker and he tried to help me. And then, now obviously it's different if you don't have 165,000 troops and you're not the sheikh of the strongest tribe in Iraq, as I was privileged to be. Right. Go, go. But, but you, can, you can have a huge impact, and we can. Go to this 2003 question. Were we inadvertently the triggering mechanism that brought about everything that's happened since? I, I'm, I'm not so sure that we were, actually. Uh, if you think about it, these didn't happen until, you know, a good decade later. Uh, I, I, can't for the life of me think of the link between Iraq, uh, even the instability in Iraq, and why a fruit vendor self-immolates in Tunisia and sets off and, and cracks this, this seemingly solid crust, turns out to be so fragile that societal unrest takes off. And then you see it in Egypt as well. You know, there's an interesting moment in Egypt that I continually f reflect back on it. President Mubarak would meet with me when I was the commander of U.S. Central Command. At a certain point, he'd always he'd lean and he'd put his hand on my knee. You know, he was like a father figure. He was about 20 years older. And he'd say, General, General, don't ever forget the Arab street. Listen, he'd say, listen to the Arab street. And I'd like to go to him now and say, hey, Mr. President, what about that Arab street, huh? Uh, what's that all about? But again, I, so I don't see that linkage. Uh, Let's do one more thing before we, okay. we close out, which is even bigger picture. I, I, we, we went through a period of, depending on where you come down on these issues, either hyperextension, overextension, appropriate extension through the Middle East, as many as 180,000 troops at different times in Afghanistan. 250,000. 250, total at, at one moment, uh, Iraq. Uh, there's a feeling that the, this presidency, as a reaction to the previous presidency, is as much about underreaction as the previous presidency, the Bush presidency, was about overreaction. There's a lot of talk about dispensability now of the United States. We, we can't do everything. We shouldn't do everything. China is rising. We have to manage that in some way. Yep. The, the, the big question, and you've studied this now over the past couple of years, yep. traveling the world. The big question is, are we in a period of decline? Is that sort of decline the worst thing in the world for the United States? 
t talk us through. Yeah. Talk us through what's coming next. Yeah. First of all, we are not in a period of decline, and I'll talk about that in a second. But second, I do think it is understandable. You know, my PhD dissertation was on the impact of Vietnam on thinking about the use of force, and you know, when you go through, when you experience firsthand, in fact, these very visceral uh, wars that we've been through, costly, frustrating, long in duration, uh, setbacks and so forth, it's understandable, I think, that there is a bit of a reaction and the pendulum swings back in the other direction. I actually think it has now swung to where it is a more appropriate balance, perhaps should swing a bit further. Again, ISIS bring it we back. Should do, I think ISIS did bring it back. Yep. I think the beheading of an American uh, is a big deal. And, uh, and the American public reacted to that, and so did their leadership. Uh, and now we recognize the, the, the threat that's posed. But the, I, I was in London a year ago, and somebody asked me in a conference, after the American century, what? And I think they expected me to say, after the American century, the Chinese century, the Asian century, or whatever. And I said, after the American century, the North American decades. Now, that's not a single decade. It's not a century. It's decades, and there's an S on the end. And the number of uh, decades will be determined, as I'll explain in a moment. But we have this extraordinary opportunity because of the energy revolution, which has really completely uh, upended, disrupted totally world energy markets. Uh, we're now the number one natural gas producer in the world. We're the number one oil liquids producer. It's larger than crude oil. Uh, we're the swing producer, no longer Saudi Arabia. Uh, and what this is doing for the economy, uh, whether you love fossil fuels or not, you do have to do something to produce electricity. I'm all for moving to renewables and so forth, but in the interim, it is awfully Aspen's nice. Aspen's official position is we're ambivalent about uh, fossil fuels. Oh, okay, good. Depends on if you own yeah, a plane or not. I notice a big round of applause there. But I, I, know, I know that you know, there's an insurmountable comparative advantage uh, if you pay $2.75 for a million metric BTU of clean burning natural gas, or, and you're in Japan, which used to pay $17 for that same amount. Now it's down a bit because of crude oil, but, but this is extraordinary. Now that was enabled by, first of all, directional drilling, hydraulic fracturing. The last one is the cloud, as Peter would be familiar. It was big data seismic technology allows you to find that. That's the IT revolution, and that is what's making all the other revolutions possible. There's a manufacturing revolution that's beginning. Uh, robotics, greater automation, additive manufacturing, three-dimensional printing, all of this is going to completely transform uh, the workplace as we have known it in the past. And then that is further enabling the life sciences revolution. Uh, and all of these revolutions, uh, you find Americans either completely leading or among the leaders. Beyond that, we have this enviable position. You know, Mexico is not asking China to pivot to Central America to offset to balance against U.S. power, as every country that surrounds uh, China and has a maritime beef with them is asking us to do. Uh, we have our number one and two trading partners, thanks to the North American Free Trade Act and the high integration 20 years after NAFTA, uh, makes Mexico our number one trading partner, or, I'm sorry, Canada number one and Mexico number two. And each of those is poised on the threshold of, of further advances. Mexico, 16 reforms that President Peña put through in his first year. So we have this extraordinary opportunity. The problem is, um, with great respect to one of the earlier speakers, to, to Paul Ryan, that we have policy headwinds that have not been dealt with the way we need to by legislation and, of course, the White House working together with Congress. Uh, we've got to fix uh, education. It's got to be reformed. We've got to do in smart infrastructure investment. Uh, we've got to keep the debt to GDP ratio going down instead of starting to go up uh, in, a, in a few years. Uh, there's a host of issues out there. Cybersecurity legislation, immigration reform. Um, you name it, trade agreements, and thankfully we do have trade promotion authority now, but that was much too close an affair. But we've got to get these headwinds turned around so that they're tailwinds, because China is slowing. China is not accelerating, and China's going to slow further, and I can lay out why that is. India may be on the threshold of the Modi moment, but there's not great momentum there yet. 
Abenomics has not yet truly transformed Japan, which faces a demographic death spiral anyway. So look around the world and you tell me a country that is more advantageously positioned than our United States and uh, North America's three so countries. To wrap up, is the question then not whether the U.S. is the indispensable nation? It's the question whether the U.S. wants to be the indispensable nation? I think the question is how the U.S. can play what is an indispensable role as thoughtfully, intelligently, and cleverly as we possibly can. General Petraeus, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you.